we're here with uh, baseball legend, Yankees legend, Red Sox and Rays legend as well, Wade Boggs. Uh, and we're here with you today, Wade, because uh, you filmed something pretty awesome uh, for PBR. Uh, we watched the spot. Um, while you finally got a little throwback revenge on Cool Blue, uh, how much fun was it teaming up with PBR to put this all together? Oh, their their uh, marketing people are are phenomenal. When when I read the script and and we we did the shoot, it was it was me. I mean, I you know since 1983, I've been walking around going, "Hey, that guy on the can that that's me." And like I said, I just I just want some answers. And I'm you know PBR hadn't called me back, and and I'm trying to put the heat on them. <laughs> now we we know that uh, this this sort of came to light because uh, you know you you are a legendary beer drinker. And you've had legendary beer drinking exploits, and sort of the basis of the ad is the famous story where you supposedly drank 107 beers on a cross country flight, then sort of saw this mascot ripping off your whole life. Um, I have to ask, you know, the, the story from the Always Sunny episode that you shared, um, how true is all of that? Do you stand by it? Oh, it's true. Oh, it's true. Yeah, it's it, actually, it wasn't 107 on the plane flight. It was only 73. Only. <laughs> they talk, wait, in that episode, I actually watched it the other day because I hadn't seen it in so long. Um, and uh there was that part in it when Dennis was saying that it's impossible to drink that much. Um, and Frank replies, not with an attitude like that. Um, and then I kind of parlayed it by watching your Hall of Fame speech. Um, and uh, the positivity kind of came through when you were uh, speaking to the crowd there um, at Cooperstown. Um, and I wanted to kind of get some insight on, you know, how you handled that throughout your career, especially in in tough markets like uh, Boston and New York. Um, and then more importantly, kind of how, you know, that uh, would maybe transition to today in like a social media driven world, how you might adjust and, and keep your positive attitude since, you know, you talked about how you were under scouted and, you know, the scout that found you took a chance on you. So, you know, the, 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 the bits and pieces of positivity from that episode kind of flowed through and then I kind of connected the dots from your Hall of Fame speech. So I wanted to hear some more about that. Well, I've, I've always been very positive and, and negativity is, is something that will destroy you. And I don't like to be around people that are negative. And I don't, I don't have an inner circle like that. All, all my friends and, and various people are, are extremely positive. And that's the, that's the way I went through my career. And never read the newspaper, never listened to talk shows. And, and because they, they, you know, they try to knock you down. They try to degrade you a little bit and, and say, you can't do this. You can't do that. So I'm, I'm going through and and I know in my mind what I have to do. And as far as being a all around ball player, you got to, you know, you got to play offense and defense. So that's, that's basically how I, I went through my whole career is, is trying to make people eat crow basically that, that told me I couldn't do something. And believe me, I, I will, I will make you eat crow. So um, that's what I'm trying to do with PBR. They're going to eat some crow. <laughs> yeah, this is just the latest stop on your revenge tour. Uh, we definitely feel that vibe. Um, but it's no secret that you're someone who liked to have fun on the field during your career. Uh, perhaps the most iconic moment of your Yankees career is the horse ride you took around the field after the 96 World Series. Um, what inspired you to take that chance and go right from the traditional dog pile on the mound right to a policeman's horse? No, no, no. Actually, the dog pile did occur. So I was on the bottom of the dog pile with uh, John Wetland. And and so and then we decided as a unit to take a lap around uh, the stadium because all the fans were so gracious and didn't come out of their seats. And next thing I know, I'm in left center field on a horse and I can't stand horses because they don't like me. And I have till this day, I've never gone back to look at the video to see how I actually got up on this horse. But uh, I, I'm on a horse riding around Yankee Stadium, and we just won a World Series. So life was great. Did that uh, get you in trouble with George Steinbrenner at all, or did he think that was awesome? Oh, no, it, it didn't. But the beard that I was, the hockey beard that I was growing uh, sort of got me in uh, a lot of hot water. <laughs> he didn't like that at all. He didn't like that <laughs> hockey beard at all. I said, I said boss, we're winning. I want it shaved off before the game. 
<laughs> that didn't happen. Yes. Uh, speaking of Mr. Steinbrenner, you specifically went out of your way to thank him in your in your Hall of Fame speech as well, which was very nice. Um, and nowadays, obviously, the Yankees haven't won a World Series or been to one since he's passed away. Um, and you have all the Yankee, you know, the, the old timer Yankee fans saying, oh, if George was alive, you know, things would be different. Um, I want some clarity. We want some clarity, in fact, about, you know, why you how, why you felt that you why you had the utmost respect for him and how he kind of um, he kind of set the tone for, you know, this that that specific Yankees dynasty and how he influenced you as a player. Well, Mr. Steinberg had had a. He didn't feel that I was washed up. He took a chance on me and 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 the Red Sox let me go. They had they had another player in Scott Cooper and and they thought that he was he was the heir apparent. But uh, Mr. Steinbrenner, uh, I had a previous offer from the Dodgers and I turned that down. And Mr. Steinbrenner called the next day. Well, he was suspended, but his his uh, son-in-law Joe Malloy called. Mr. Steinbrenner was uh, suspended at the time. And they came on board, offered me a three-year deal, and and the money was 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 great. And I said, "Wow, playing the two greatest cathedrals ever, uh, Fenway Park and and Yankee Stadium, and be a part of two two unbelievable organizations with the rich history of all the great players that have ever gone through there." And uh, so I said, "Wow, this this is a no-brainer." Where quick. And Question yeah. on that. I want because obviously Boston and New York that that weighs into it too. Which which was better for partying? Well, I, I never partied at home because of uh, my family and everything like that. So um, uh, we would go out, my wife and I, in New York City, and and she loves the city, and and same way with Boston. We would go out in Boston, and and uh, we had places that we'd go in the North End and and Palace Nightclub in Boston back in the day, and. And all that good stuff. But uh, as far as fan base goes, I mean, they're both electric. They're both uh, hungry. And uh, good thing since the Red Sox have won a few World Series since I had left, uh, their their fans are, are a little less uh, cantankerous. Um, they're, they're ch- they poke their chest out a little bit more and, and don't have to sort of cower down to the to the uh, 27 uh, World Championships at the the uh yankees have yeah we have uh, definitely been on a more even playing field lately um but it, it, you when you transitioned from the red sox to the yankees we've seen a lot of players do it lately but you were definitely one of the first major stars to switch sides it was kind of like babe ruth you know large gap and and then you did it um and and then right after you left new york roger clemens uh, you know, completed his transition and trip across the AL East goes from Boston to Toronto to New York. Um, did you uh, did you have any anxiety at the time that you changed sides or was it all just pride? And uh, did you speak to to Clemens on his way into New York at all about what to expect? No, I, I, I never spoke to Roger on, on that, but uh, I knew that it was going to be tough going from Boston to New York. And, and I wasn't I wasn't very loved in New York. And so. It, it, they still booed me about the first couple to three weeks I was there when they announced my name because that's all they'd ever heard for 11 years when I was in Boston. So uh started playing the way I had played in the past and and then they warmed up and 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 then we had a, a great relationship for five years. It was it was really great place to play. We had some great teammates. We had some great teams and 94. If Bud Selig doesn't pull the plug, uh, we probably win a World Series that year. That was a great year for us. That's best, the best Yankee team that I played on and, and probably the best team, period. But, um, yeah, we had, a, we had a great time, and, and we, just, we just kept the Mets on the back page all the time while I was there. <laughs> you mentioned 94. That was the second part of my next question. Um, you obviously spent some pre-Dynasty years in New York with young Paul O'Neill, Bernie Williams. Um, helping build build out the dynasty back in like 93, 94, 95. Did you know you and your teammates were close to something special at that point? Well, we had like personalities. I, I think that this is a direction that uh, the Yankees were going. Uh, they were they were tired of the Bronx Zoo. They were tired of of uh, the bickering and, and various things like that in the clubhouse. They still won with that attitude. But they went out and got the Spike Owens and the Paul O'Neills and Jimmy Keys and Wade Boggs of, of that type of uh, atmosphere 
and just added to the product that they had. I mean, they had gold glove first baseman and Don Mattingly. And then in 94, 95, I was the gold glove third baseman, uh, young Bernie Williams, uh, a young Derek Jeter in 96. But uh, uh, our, our 93 team was, was very good. And then 94 was outstanding. And then we run in, into a buzzsaw in Seattle in 95. But um, other than that, after that, they, they, they exploded. And that's when they took off with, with Posada and, and Pettit and, and the core four, like they uh, want to call them. But, um, yeah, they went on an unbelievable run. It speaks to, I think, uh, your unique skill set and also sort of exactly what the Yankees have been missing in recent years almost. Um, you know, you mentioned the gold glove defense that you paired with your patience at the plate, your high average, like you feel like someone who would be a dream addition to this current team. Um, does that sort of resonate? Do you sort of agree or disagree that maybe like adding a veteran like you with that high IQ and that attitude, just, you you know, you could not pull you from a game uh, is sort of what these modern Yankees could use now. Well, I, I think that, that, Aaron Judge is, is trying to have that persona that um, I'm the captain, uh, I'm leading by example. Um, it's it's they got a, a, a lot of moving parts in New York right now, and the, these are the questions uh, uh, trying to deal with injuries. Uh, their their pitchers are on and off, other than Cole, um, and and it's it's one of those things that that Doyle now Stanton's back on the IL and, and, but the, the thing is, is, is there has to become a point in time to where the cohesiveness of the whole team takes over. And then once that starts, then everybody starts to know their role. And once they know their role, well, am I playing second today or am I playing center or am I playing? I, and then they start to know their role. Uh, if this problem doesn't evolve, uh, then it becomes a management problem. Uh, um, it, it's never a player's problem. It's always a management problem. And then they look into replacing the manager. So um, these are the things that, that they're going to have to look at down the road. Yeah, you want to talk about management problems. I think we could go back to the Red Sox. You know, we're, we're very dialed in with what's going on in Boston and um, we're following everything that's going on there. What do you think's happened with them you know they have the 2018 run we were scared to death that that dynasty was gonna that was the beginning of a dynasty that was gonna kill the Yankees for years to come then they tore it all down and now we don't really know what they're doing what's what's your take on what's going on over there well I, I, it's they had uh Coro suspended for the year or, or what have you and then brought in another guy and he brought in his guys and now they they brought in more coaches that and there are a lot of young guys that are trying to feel their way through the through the young uh, through the lineup, and get their feet wet in the big leagues. And and I think you know, uh, Chain Bloom, he's he's young, you know, he's young. He's getting his teeth cut too. And that when you're young like that, uh, you make mistakes and then learn from those. Uh, and I'm I'm sure in the beginning that uh, Brian Cashman had the same growing pains when he was a young GM and, and made a decision and everybody didn't like it. Well, and now it seems like every decision he makes is right. So it, it's, it's a learning process. It's not only a learning process for rookie players out there, but, uh, but front office as well. Um, and they have to develop a team that's going to blend and everybody, like I said, is basically on the same page and, and, once they find that cohesiveness and we got to keep sale healthy, that's, that's one of the big, one of the big cogs in the, in the whole machine. Um, I think they'll do fine. Now to tie things back into, you know, your ability to prove people wrong. Um, you, not only do you get your 3000 hit sort of at the end of your incredible career, but you go yard to do it. Um, and very few people have gone, you know, got number 3000 with a homer. It, it's you and, and Jeter and A-Rod, which is kind of an incredible club. 
Um, did it mean more to be able to prove to everybody, like, look, I have power, obviously, you know, I've always had this power, um, and now I get to be remembered forever for it, or were you just sort of caught up in the moment, excited for the hit no matter what? I was sort of caught up in the moment. It wasn't one one of those that Hollywood scripted and said, okay, we're, we're going to have 3,000 for the home run, because no one had ever done it. And and the year before that, Paul Molitor was the first one to hit a triple. So uh, it, it wasn't scripted by any meaning of the imagination. It was a 2-2 spin and curveball and just got it elevated and, and pulled it out of the ballpark. I, I think Hollywood would have written a 15 hopper and a hold a short uh, had, it, had it been one of those. But, uh, yeah, I, I hit the first home run as a double ray. Uh, my first home run as a Red Sox player in 82 was a walk-off against Detroit. So a lot of my home runs have been memorable. And, uh, and naturally, the 3,000 uh, to be the first player to ever do it was, uh, was, was very special. Yeah, and that, that propelled you to Cooperstown, and you're there now every year for you know, the, the induction. So what's, what's your favorite part about going back there, and, and who, who would you say the best storyteller is when, when you're up there for the weekend? Oh, uh, we, well, we, we took a really hit with COVID and, uh, and, and 2020 and, and lost seven hall of famers, but, uh, uh, just Sunday night when we had the ring ceremony with, with 59, 57 hall of famers in one room and, and, and when, uh, uh, back when, when, uh, Joe Morgan and Johnny bench and, and, uh, Tony Perez, they would sit there and try to figure out who was the best on the big red machine. And they'd start yelling at each other. And, and Yogi was when, when Yogi was alive, God bless him. He, he was, he was one of the best storytellers of, of all time. Uh, we all miss Yogi. We, we all miss the Yankee greats as, as well. And we, we certainly miss you in the Bronx. Now we know they have old timers day coming back up again this fall. I, I'm not sure if you're planning to attend or if you've spoken to the Yankees yet, but if if so, uh, or would you plan to attend in the future and come back to Yankee Stadium? Oh, sure, sure. I just uh, through scheduling conflicts in the past, I uh, haven't been able to attend. But uh, oh, sure, yeah, absolutely, I would come back. Amazing. Well, better we, yet, are we, we? Sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, no, better yet. I want to know, Wade, if we're going to see more of you on the big screen, you know, over these last <laughs> over over the years, you know, you, you've you been on Cheers, you've been on The Simpsons, It's Always Sunny, Family Guy, you made an appearance. Um, now we got now we got this very great ad that hopefully will uh, will uh, birth something else. What, what what are your plans is, you know, this being part of your your post career uh, life? I don't know. I, I love Hollywood and I'm a ham on I'm a ham on camera. So um, hopefully there's something big in the in the near future. Amazing. Well, we can't wait to see what's next. Uh, the website is bogsisblue.com. Uh, and from what we understand, PBR has yet to respond to your attacks. So uh, obviously we're, we're waiting to hear from, from their side, uh, but you've got your message out there. Is there anything else that the people should know about this campaign? Well, it's just that uh, when you look at uh, the, the picture on the can, it's Wade Box. Yeah, it sells itself. Everybody, if you haven't taken a look, take a look, get acquainted. Boggs clearly is blue. And Wade, uh, we think you're blue. We think you look better in blue pinstripes. We appreciate so much uh, you hanging out with us today. This was amazing and a dream. Good deal, guys. Enjoyed it. That's all about you guys. Have a great day.